morning friends my name is reena kalo i am a student and teacher of english language and literature and i have been writing sporadically for many years i am fond of reading especially indian literature in english my husband is a colonel in the army and thus we have lived in far flung regions of the country gaining rich socio cultural insights into the lives of people of various regions of our country i recently wrote a story and i would like to share it with all of you The story is a recollection of the uncommon life of an old woman seen through the eyes of a grandchild. It is a realistic depiction of the times she lived in and the particular idiosyncrasies she had that made her so different. The story has a universal appeal as one can easily relate to many aspects of it and strike a harmonious chord. I hope you enjoyed the story. It is titled Unsung Unknown. Everyone called her Babi ji, my grandmother, my father and even I. No one knew how she had acquired that name but somehow it had stuck. And while we were growing up, we couldn't imagine she could have any other name but Babi ji. However, the irony is that she was no one's Babi. She was my great grandmother, a tiny woman with the girth of a matriarch, but no pronounced halo of the great mother around her. She was always clad in white linen. the customary attire of the widow in our country the pallu of her sari covering most of her small head she was not too old having married young but for as long as i can remember she had wrinkles and her wrinkles became grooves every time she laughed hers was a strange kind of laughter it did not feel real it seemed she made those smirking or giggling sounds only to appease and bargain for small favors I wonder if she had ever had a real laugh. Every time she wanted an extra spoon of sugar for her favorite sweet lime, she would make that sound. She loved sweets, but my strict grandmother would ration them for her and for all of us. But Babi ji's share was always little. You see, my grandmother and she never got along. Other than the classic reason that she was her mother-in-law, a more prominent reason was that Babi ji was my grandfather's stepmother. and had entered the household when my grandfather was barely 5 and legend has it that she like all stepmothers had been unkind to him that was always at the back of our minds and gave us the freedom to be inconsiderate to her whenever we wanted that doesn't mean that we were encouraged to be rude to her she had her share of kindnesses and unkindness from all of us living in that house and even the neighbors I remember how I used to protest when my grandmother would haughtily switch off the fan where she was sitting and ask her to join the others in some other room. As a devout Jain, my grandmother reasoned that we should not use more than we require and save whatever we can. That was the excuse given for this slight to our questioning young minds. However, we knew that it was another win in the constant repartee going on between them. Babaji was an unobtrusive presence. one could acknowledge it or completely ignore it she was seen loitering in her big house in and out of the kitchen in the garden or the driveway taking very small measured steps she was walking most of the day keeping herself fit perhaps knowingly she knew exactly what to eat also when and how i remember her telling us to drink water sitting down and milk standing she would drink the gravy and not eat the chana saying that is where all the energy lies She would eat carrot and spinach a lot as they were good for her failing eyes. One of my favorite memories of my childhood are seeing her chopping spinach or saag with a curved blade fixed on a wooden block. She would sit on the cool marble of the veranda overlooking the garden and chop away diligently with precision and perfection. She seemed so important at those times. We would sit circling her and watch her do this amazing and dangerous feat. Her fingertips would repeatedly come close to the sharp edge of the blade, yet miraculously escape it. We would plead with her to let us try it too. She never relented, but kept the appeasing smile on. She had had a difficult life, but she never spoke about it. It seemed that she didn't think about her past or had any complaints with her present. Her existence was purely a day-to-day -day affair. Get up in the morning, bathe, eat your meals, take a nap. and then retire to your room at sunset she never ate after sunset and woke up very hungry the next morning 
In many ways, she led the life of an ascetic, taking the minimum required for sustenance from the world around her. My father often said that she was a saint who had experienced very few pleasures of life. We hear she was a beautiful bride who glowed in the bloom of youth, decked in gold and color. However, not even a year had passed that her husband passed away. Just a year of blended bliss had been her share, and after that, the long years of loneliness in a white shroud. Many had cajoled her to get married again, but she was adamant. If a marriage had been written for her by the hand of God, it would have lasted, she believed. Her closest living relative was her daughter, Sushila. True to her name, she was an ideal child, respectful and loving and extremely tolerant. Born three days after her father's death, she had not even seen her father, but considered her stepbrother her guardian and parent. She was immensely attached to my grandfather and felt indebted to my grandmother to have ensured an education for her and empowered her to look out for herself. While growing up, we always enjoyed sitting and chatting with her on her annual visits to our house from her abode in the hills of Himachal. She was such a gracious presence, extending help and counsel to all who needed it, irrespective of age or relation. Every action of hers was imbued with patience and love. However, I don't remember her sharing a special bond with her own mother. They would never be seen sitting all by themselves deep in conversation. She spent most of her time with my grandmother. She felt great allegiance to her that stemmed from gratitude, fear, and undoubtedly affection and respect. Perhaps she avoided being with her mother so that my grandmother was not offended by it. I can only imagine how Babaji must have brought her up all by herself, desolate in the desperate loneliness of a young widow. What is astonishing is that she never spoke about it, never impressed upon others what a raw deal she had got. We find the meanest of reasons to compare our lives with others and frown upon their successes. This woman was impervious to envy and despair and did not think of herself as a martyr. Nothing excited or perturbed her much. The only thing that disturbed her peace was the stifling heat of the North Indian summer. She had an excruciating time in the months of June and July. Her first floor room absorbed all the heat of the sun through the day and during power outage at night became a furnace. She found it so difficult to bear it. Everything else meant just the same to her. Babiji was always at home. She walked a mile once a month to her homeopath and got those sweet white tiny globules of medicine. Other than that, she was a permanent fixture, day and night. In the three decades that I lived in that house, I saw her venture out only once. She had been invited to her brother's house in Delhi for a wedding. I packed a suitcase for her with white and cream silk saris with matching handkerchiefs. That was a highlight. But in hindsight, I feel I was more excited about her outing than she. She lived every day as it came to her. She enjoyed the weddings in the house, looked forward to getting gifts and saved every penny from her allowance. She was particular about not spending her own money and whenever she needed it, she would look at my generous mother who would not fail her even once. She would not let any vendor go by without us tasting his wares. Very sweetly, she would murmur to my mother, Harsh, give me some change. I want to buy falsas. Sometimes it would be Bhutta or Ampapar or Murmura or Golgappas. Notwithstanding the somber tone of her tragic life, there was a lot of color in her spirit. She had a keen observation and a sense of beauty too. When she first met my husband-to-be, she approved of him simply because he had good features and a sharp nose. I had expected her to have reservations about him as ours was an intercaste marriage, but she took to him right away. When she passed away in the wee hours of the morning without being any trouble to anyone, it seemed that her long penance had finally ended. She had, no, she had made no friends and no enemies in this lifetime because she had remained invisible to everyone around her. Perhaps her karma was such that during this lifespan, she had balanced the sum of good and evil that she had done in all her past lives. She was free now, no longer bound in the human body. Those that lived with her in bits and pieces of her long nine decades sometimes ponder whether they did right by her. I often think 
Should I not have prodded a bit more? Should I not have been more concerned, more involved? She never made me feel that she needed me or anyone for that matter. But is that excuse valid for not extending the human touch that we all yearn for? And yes, her real name was Shanti Devi. Thank you, friends. I hope you enjoy, you like the story. Thank you.